Welcome to the Shetland Times podcast. I'm your host, Thor Holt, and today's guest is Gibby Fraser from West Butterfirth. Please remember, we'd love to hear who you would like to hear on the show, so you can let me know on Twitter, at Thor Holt, or you can let the Shetland Times know you know where they are. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Gibby Fraser. Hello, sir. Hello, Gibby. How are you doing? Not too bad. Long time no see, no hear. <laughs> it is indeed. You never called, you never wrote. <laughs> <laughs> as they say. <laughs> Guilty as charged, yes. <laughs> Likewise. Uh, how's things with you? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Just uh-huh. looking, looking forward to hearing a tale of daring from the southern seas or something from you. Because <laughs> I've been told you're the yeah, man well. for the for the whaling chat. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I never knew you'd been to the whaling. I obviously knew that you were a man of the sea, but I didn't realise you were at the whaling. For some reason, I yeah, thought you'd yeah. be too young for that. Yeah. No offence. <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I went away. I was 16 when I left to go on my first trip. That was in 1958. And um, I ended up doing four seasons at the Welling. It uh, could have been five when I had a motorcycle accident which rolled one out, and then I got down for the last one. Mm-hmm. But I spent all my time at the Welling on the whale catchers. The ones that actually did the harpooning. Yeah. What was your job then? I was, uh, well, best described as a housewife. Us <laughs> <laughs> boys all went away as what was known as mess boys, mm-hmm. or deck mess boys, especially in the, in the case of a whale catcher. And um, your primary job was to uh, work along with the cook. Um, he was known as the steward, mm-hmm. but uh, he was the cook. And um, you helped him in the galley, preparing the food. So he sent you to the storeroom for ingredients and what have you. And you also had to look after the ship, uh, clean the alleyways and the toilets and the cabins and, and uh, keep everything nice and clean. The Norwegians were sticklers for that. There was uh, 15 Norwegians and four Britishers on this whale catcher. And um, that was basically it. However, if they needed you on deck, they could override the cook and they could call you out on deck. Sometimes towards the end of the season, we would get uh, icing up conditions. It might yeah. last 20 minutes or it might last most of a day. You, you didn't know. And everybody was out with axes and iron bars and hammers, anything that could chop ice. And um, there were two deck boys on the catchers. The oldest one was always the one that was called out when we caught a whale. And uh, his job was to go up to the gun platform and uh, put the airline in the whales. The baleen whales would sink. Mm -hmm. The sperm whales would float, but the baleen whales would sink if you didn't inflate them. And um, you also, it was your responsibility to have um, the shells ready to put in the gun and the harpoon tips and all the explosives that went with it, detonators and what have you. That was all your responsibility to make sure that was... There was a ready supply of that on the gun platform when they needed it, and you helped to reload the gun... And that sort of thing. It's a, it's a wee bit more than your than your standard housewife behaviour, I have to say. Unless unless housewives have a different kind of role to the one I understand. Well, I don't think the housewives of the day would put up with half of it. <laughs> 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 the the it was the the work wasn't hard, but it was the conditions you worked under that was tough. These mm-hmm. well catchers, I don't know if you've ever seen one in action, but they're very very lively ships very lively um, and they would roll all over the place and I'm seeing you just would cry on some days you'd know, be working in an alleyway scrubbing a particularly difficult stain off the floor and then the, you'd take a roll and you didn't get the bucket in time it went, <laughs> <laughs> went over on its side and you would swab it all up and start again What kind of size of a boat or ship is the She, she was built as a Royal Navy Corvette and um, did her bit in the war time. Um, she was on five Russian convoys, and um, 
she was also in the Mediterranean, where along with a another catch, uh, another uh, I think it was a destroyer she was along with, and they, they depth charged the submarine to the surface. And I actually have photographs of that submarine with all the crew standing out on the deck ready to be rescued. Mm-hmm. And um, so she was uh, about almost 200 feet long. They were longer than the normal whale catcher. The, most of the salvage whale catchers were built at a place in Middlesbrough called Smith's Dock. And they built fantastic ships there. But um, they, this one, the one I was on, had been built in Glasgow. They, were, uh, they built these corvettes all over the place because there was such a demand for them when the war came on as convoy escorts yeah. and submarine hunters and that sort of thing. So how did the catcher go to a bigger ship, though? Was that a factory ship associated yes, with it? we were part of the... I was part of the Southern Venturer Expedition. And <laughs> when I applied to Salveson first, I, I wrote a letter when I when the whalers came home asking for a job with one of their expeditions and they said they would make up their minds later on in the summer and they'd keep me in mind so sometime in August middle of August I got a letter saying that uh, they could place me and give me a job as a deck mess boy and uh, it had this W stroke C behind it and I thought that was a water closet or something I, I never <laughs> I didn't associate it with well catcher, but yeah. I was was needing to work anyhow, and I was wanting to go. So I had to present myself at uh, Monkfield Hospital in Larwig, and there you got a chest X-ray. I remember going in there, and uh, there was a whole lot of men there, and some of them seemed very old, and they seemed quite huge too, a lot of them, and typical Shetland style with a some with hats, some with berries on, but most of them with a, a, a navy blue raincoat belt around the middle, which seemed to be the, the done thing in those days. And of course, there were some younger boys there who had been down the year before, and maybe another couple or so who were, like myself, hopeful. And uh, you had to, you got your uh, x-ray, and then you got a letter from Salveson again saying that they wanted you at their office, and uh, sometime in September I think it was about the middle of September so you had to pick up this this uh, x-ray and bring it along with you and that was looked at scrutinized fairly well and uh, the doctor gave you a really top to toe um, examination he fiddled around in places I didn't think he really needed to fiddle around with, but he did <laughs> and um, you were past this fit. They took particular attention to your teeth. And I think that was something to do with the water, especially the water in South Georgia, where the, that came straight out of a glacier. It was mm-hmm. beautiful, but it seemed to be any any defect in your teeth, I think um, it seemed to find it out. Yeah. But um, I passed okay and uh, did my summer, my season, and... <laughs> The following year was a bit of a laugh when you went back again. This old doctor remembered you. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was from Eriski on the west coast of Scotland, and, and the, the way of a crofter in Eriski was just the same as Shetland. They fished for Baltics and uh, they salted down sheep and all that sort of thing. So he was very interested in the Shetland men, and he said, How are you? You're going back another season? Yes, you're going back. Sir. How are you feeling? Oh, all right. Good as last year. Oh, yes. And he had a list there, and he went tick, 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 tick down this list. <laughs> and he said, I'll see you in the old ship tonight. That was a hotel just across the road and along around the corner of that. Yeah. If you didn't get there before nine o'clock, you usually met them carrying them out. <laughs> Every, everybody plied him, we think, and he didn't know his limit. But uh, he was a nice guy for all that. So... Uh, after the, after you'd uh, seen the doctor, then you had some form filling to do in, uh, in the office, and then you were appointed to your whale catcher. And you were given a railway warrant. In that case, we had to go to Glasgow to join a ship called the Southern Garden. The Southern Garden was a tanker that had been built in Germany prior to the First World War, and she had been called the Gedania. And 
in the Second War, she was captured somewhere off the Azores. Uh, she had been um, servicing the, the, you know, the, the Germans had these armed ships, that, the raiders, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. went around by themselves and sank lone ships and that sort of thing, and took people prisoners, and she was captured there as a, as a prize, and mm -hmm. of course mm -hmm. taken over by the government. And then Salvis and bought her at the end of hostilities and used her for many years. They built uh, accommodation across her well deck, so she could carry about, I think it was 120 men, something like that. Um, and we left Glasgow and we went across to South America to a place called Carapito. Now, Carapito is uh, about... I think about 60 miles up the up a river, a rather wide, muddy-looking river, and um, there was nothing there where we tied up. It was just a bunker station. It was mm -hmm. just where ships came and loaded oil and left from. The, it was still tidal right up there, and the banks of the river was very sloping and, and entirely mud. You fell in there. You were in difficulties. So you had to walk ashore on a across a gangway and uh, a little way up this gangway it branched off to your left along the top of the river bank and there was a little canteen there where you could have uh, they sold rum and coke and beer and of course we all went along there and <clears throat> it was a kind of a very ramshackle sort of a hut I remember cages along the back wall with parrots and, and monkeys in it and the the boys that had given the monkeys sips of alcohol as the night wore on and they were just like us some got happy and some got angry and wanted to fight <laughs> some fell asleep so how give me how long had it taken you to get from glasgow you you kind of said it as if you just nipped across on a plane ride but you were on that ship for what how many weeks would it have taken to get down there uh, it took 6 weeks to get to south georgia yeah we were about probably halfway when we were in Venezuela, mm -hmm. in, in Carapito. There was a city about a couple of miles away, but nobody went there because all the police there were armed, and uh, you had to come out through a gate, and it was guarded by the police. And those who had been before said that if you bought any souvenirs or had any money on you, they took it off you at the point <laughs> of a gun. So nobody went there. That's not so friendly for tourists such as yourself. Not really, no. <laughs> If we had, um, we got visits from little guys in their dugout canoes with bananas and little marmoset monkeys and everything they wanted to sell us. And they, well, they, they'd give you a lot of stuff for a shirt or something like that, you know. A pair of old sandals was valuable to them. But um, that was it, and then we left, and we sailed out of the warm weather and into the southern ocean, into the roaring 40s, and and then we, we arrived in, in South Georgia one afternoon, and it was uh, it was quite a <laughs> eye-opening experience. It was a black, rocky shore and very, very steep mountains rising straight up almost from the shoreline, and uh, a lot of snow on the mountains. And we came in past uh, the Salvation's main base, Leith Harbour, which was an active fishing, uh, whale fishing base that had its own factory and it's where the whales were cut up and cooked and that. And we went to another base called Stromnes <clears throat> that used to be a whaling station but Salvison took it over and it became a, a repair base. He had two floating docks there where he could lift the catches up and service them during the winter months. Mm -hmm. And um, there were plater shops and all sorts of lathes and milling machines. And they could actually have built a ship down there because they had the machines to roll the plates and what have you. So were these, just can I clarify then, Gibby, were these towns like Leith and Stromness? Is that what you said they were called? Leith and Stromness? Yes. Were they, were they like active towns all year round or was it a seasonal uh, thing? Were, were they, no, were the they, people they were always mined. Yeah. They were always mined. Um, you see, at the end of the season, say you went down like I did and you, you came back to Leith Harbour, you could, during the season, put your name in for a job to overwinter mm -hmm. on the island of South Georgia. 
which meant that you stayed there during their winter. That was when they they did all the whale catcher repairs and refurbishment and and uh, to get the catchers ready for next season. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a time when there was a lot of people made a lot of money that way. I um, I didn't get to to, to go down. I'll, I'll come to that later, the reason for that. But um, you could go home at the end of the season. But if you stayed, if you overwintered, then you had to do your overwintering and then do another season before you got home. So you were away 18 months. Mm-hmm. You were away about seven months on, on a season. But if you did, did it this way, then 18 months was your... Uh, time away from home and it was long enough to be out of the country so that you could get all your tax back and that so it was very it was uh, very attractive and then in fact there's, there's quite a lot of the businesses his own Shetland yet that were started up by money earned in this way in fact mm-hmm. uh, I know the the big quals of Persnetter, the research uh, her skipper the, the original Matty Paulson he overwintered and uh, got enough money to buy a fishing boat and was successful and just progressed on from there. So was that the motivator for most of you guys? You must have known other guys that were at the whaling. Was that the main motivator? Was that financial or was it about the adventure being a young a young man? What was the reasoning for leaving Shetland and heading off to do this? It was part of both. Um, see, there was not much work in Shetland in those days. There was no crab factory in Larwick or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a, it was very busy in the summer here with the herring fishing. Of course, that was all drift net. And there was a, all the work was very much... Uh, there wasn't much automation, let's say. There was a lot of men needed, a lot mm-hmm. of manpower. And um, that was fine during the summer, but the winter time things closed down. The fishing was only carried on by small sea netters. Uh, I suppose you'll remember, like... the little ones that used to come and fish in the bay sometimes. <clears throat> they were the only kind of boats that were here at that time. To be, to be honest, Gibby, the boat I remember the most is probably your boat, because it was a beautiful, distinctive colour. And anyone, <laughs> anyone that knows <laughs> the Enterprise uh, will know that it was an unusual colour. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I once, I was telling Lorena, I once did a painting of the Enterprise off the west coast of Papastua and entered it in the Waz show when I was like 10 or something and much to my annoyance only got second prize but anyway thank you for your boat being the model for my <laughs> That's all right yeah two right. businesses there's one guy I know that went into buy, uh, he bought trucks and he, he rented a quarry and made blocks and that sort of thing so mm-hmm. it was really a way to make something of yourself but, um, that Otherwise, you wouldn't have got. Then I I didn't put in for a winter the winter the first season, but I did the second season. We had a we had a rather difficult season. My my second season, I did three seasons on the same catcher, mm-hmm. and our second season on the way down, um, the the factory ship took all the Norwegians down, and they went to a place called Aruba in the Netherlands Antilles in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. That's where they went for fuel. And just after Carapito, then we got word that the guy that was mate on our catcher had gone overboard. He got some sort of bad news from home and decided to end it all, which was a tragedy because he really was a very, very, very nice man. Mm -hmm. You never saw him with all the smile on his face. But we went down and put in for the winter. And then when you started whaling, the first three weeks or so of the season you hunted only sperm whale and then the the balloon whale season would start and you would be after thin or blue if you could find them mm-hmm. there weren't many blue whales around and uh, we were chasing blue whales this day and we came up alongside them and of course you're, they were going at about well we were doing about 18 knots and we were slowly overtaking them and the gunner shot one out on the port side and it turned 90 degrees and dived under the boat and knocked off our Aztec dome. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they used to follow them underwater with Aztec, the same Aztec that was used in hunting the, the submarine. Yeah. 
<coughs> so we had to go back to Leith Harbour and go and dry dock and get another uh, set of ice stick, uh, an ice stick dome put in. That took us away from the expedition for a while. And um, being, being the, the corvettes were the most successful of all the catchers, so we were always first the second boat at the end of the season. We knew that. So this gave us a bit of a knockback. And, and um, <coughs> about two weeks or so from the end of the season, we were chasing whales one day, and I was, my job at that time, that afternoon, was doing these alleyways, and uh, being the oldest deck boy, then I was always ready to fly out on deck when needed, and we chased mm -hmm. these whales. And you, you come across a pack like this every now and then, who you, when the gunner was just about ready to go down and they were coming within range, they would dive. You wouldn't see them for maybe 10, 20 minutes, and then they'd come up somewhere astern, and you'd be off after them again, because they were, <laughs> these gunners were very, very determined men. And then I could hear on the loudspeakers. Uh, there was a speaker on the bridge, one in the engine room, and one in the barrel up the top of the mast, where the crew could communicate with the bridge or the engine room or whatever. And um, I heard this, uh, something had happened in the engine room. And the chief went running up past, and after a while he came running down again, and there was no more movement of the engine, but there was clanging and banging as they got going on something. And it turned out that our crankshaft had broken in a couple of places. It hadn't actually broken so much as it had cracked, a little hairline crack on it. Mm -hmm. So um, that was as effectively stopped. We couldn't move. We were about 70 miles from the factory ship, and they, were, they appointed a, a catcher to come and tow us. Now, on this expedition, you had so many ships like the one I was on who were dedicated whale catchers. And then you had three, maybe four, of the older, slower catchers mm -hmm. who were dedicated to picking up the whales that we we caught and towed them to the factory ship. They were known as boy boats. And uh, this boat that they contacted was already towing five or six whales to the factory. That, of course, that slowed her down quite a bit. And um, she wouldn't be with us till the following morning. So we... Uh, our gunner said to us that uh, came and explained our situation and he said uh, we may have to leave the ship during the night there's ice about some ice to all around us big mm -hmm. icebergs and he says um, you just make sure you have warm clothing no luggage your personal papers your wallet with any money you have and any papers that's in that that's your lot mm -hmm. so I went to bed and read my book for a while and and went sound asleep and in the morning I woke up fine and it was a sort of a misty morning and the catcher was on her way she arrived at Silas about 11 o'clock and um, the man who the skipper of that boat could really handle his ship he came up just within a few feet of our bow and he passed the ropes across and our crew had been ready um, making up tow lines out of nylon whale lines so we got that all organized, and he would have been probably a couple of hundred yards ahead of us. Mm -hmm. He towed us to the factory ship, and, and he put us right in alongside the factory ship where we should go. And he just kept the strain on the ropes, and the engineers came down, had a look, and shook their heads and went up again, and we set off, and <clears throat> we towed for a day or so towards Leith Harbour. We were about 2,000 miles from... South Georgia, we're off a place called Enderby Land, and um, after a day we got a, a telegram from Salveson saying that uh, the two catchers were to proceed to Cape Town, mm -hmm. so that was another 2,000 miles, so we were just about the same distance from uh, South Georgia as we were from Cape Town, and we, we set off for there, and everything went fine until we were about a, inside a week out then um, we got very, very bad weather. That was crossing the Roaring Forties. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the barrel on the top of a mast, the catcher's mast, is, is 70 feet. There's 70 feet above the deck or there about, between 60 and 70 feet. And there were times we couldn't see his mast, and he couldn't see us. It slowed us down a lot, and he was getting very concerned about his fuel consumption. Mm -hmm. 
But um, it eased after a couple of days, and we we made good good time, and we came up off uh, Cape Town. We dropped the toe, and um, Doug came and took us in. And of course, this ca- well, other catch, she sailed away in and tied up. And when he dipped his tanks, he had four and a half tons of fuel oil left. That was less than a whole day steaming. <laughs> Things getting tight so there. <laughs> cutting it a bit fine, yeah. yeah. So um, we were there four or five days, and um, <clears throat> it was funny being there because all the people in uh, Kitterland there was all complaining of how the, the, it was getting colder, and we were going around in shorts. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> so I bet you were, yeah. Lovely. And... Um, we were told we were going to, the ship was going to a place just north of Cape Town to be repaired, a place called Saldana Bay. At, um, that didn't materialize, and then we were going to be, and, and we were going to fly home, which sounded fine, and then we were going to go home on, the, on one of the Union Castle boats. There was mm-hmm. a big one lying in there just not far from us called the Pendennis Castle, and we thought that would be a nice adventure as well. But... Um, it turned out that they came down, two trucks came down one morning and each had a big coil of wire on their backs and that was transferred to our deck. And the other catcher, she set off out and waited for us in the bay and uh, Doug took us out and we, we got the tow lines established again and this was insurance wires that they'd come with. So we set off towing towards Britain. Towing towards um, Britain, did you say? Yes. What, from Cape <laughs> we, Town? <laughs> we had <laughs> halfway across the Gulf there, then um, the, the, he, of course he was using fuel and we weren't. We just yeah. had enough for steering and lights and that sort of thing. So he slowed up and with the weight of the wires that pulled us ahead and we got right up behind them, put a rope on them and then we transferred oil and mm-hmm. fuel oil to him. And then he told us to Dakar in French West Africa. And it was a repeat of Cape Town, going in and getting fuel and coming out again. And uh, we did the same again in the Bay of Biscay. We got a lovely chance, and he towed us right to Middlesbrough yeah. in, uh, in England. And that's where she was repaired. And uh, they came alongside, they dropped the tow, and then uh, Tug came and took us, and then he came alongside, and he, they transferred all the Norwegians onto that ship. And the Britishers on that one came aboard us, and... That was it for that season. So how how does that work? Like you, sp- you spoke about being first boat or second boat. I assume that was in catch, like in tonnage. So in catch, yeah. Ha- did, did that disaster with the crankshaft or whatever it was, did that affect the um, the earnings it of knocked, the crew? It knocked us... Uh, oh, yes, yeah. We were paid on the whales we caught. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but um, the production. Mm-hmm. If you got big fat whales and there's a lot of oil in them you got more money if you got some scrawny things then there wasn't so much oil and it was all all followed through very very carefully every boat uh, what every boat got was uh, your, the crew benefited from well I was going to ask you Gibby what what was the whale used for was it only oil and I mean I know obviously there are still countries whaling today so what, what do they use whales for? Is it purely the oil? Is that the... No, 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 there's lots of things, lots of things. It, it went into margarine and uh, some of the sperm whale products uh, went actually into cosmetics mm-hmm. and perfume and uh, the, meat, the meat was cooked, all the oil was cooked out of it or boiled out of it and then the meat was dried, the bones was dried and ground up into meat meal and bone meal mm-hmm. and that was... Uh, Idiot Doug. <laughs> That's going out good. Um, that went in. That went for cattle feed. Yeah. And uh, they made uh, they made bovril. Oh, that's right. I heard. I was watching a wee uh, oil uh, whaling documentary <coughs> right enough, and I thought I heard the guy talk about bovril, and I I thought I'd misheard it. But so really, that's what went mm-hmm. into bovril. Yes, they made they made bovril. We used to get tins of that on board the catcher for our own use. And, and, of course, we ate some of them. We used to eat the fin whale and the sai and the blue. Not that we got very many blue whales, but um, there weren't many of them around. 
So what's your thoughts on it these days? Because obviously it's politically a bit of a hot potato, the idea of whaling. So the J Japanese and Nor Norwegians certainly still whale, don't they? What's your thoughts yeah, on it now? Any... I, I don't see the need of it, really. The, the, at the time we did it, um, in, the, in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, the world was a different place and we needed the products. Nowadays there's so many substitutes and... Mm -hmm. So much machinery is now electronic, you could say, that needed lubricating and all that. And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see the need of it, but um, having said that, I, I don't see anything wrong with the uh, Eskimos and people like that taking a few whales. There's no different house going taking in a hug and taking them off and eating them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's subsistence. But certainly for the kind of expeditions we went on, there is absolutely no need for that. And I don't understand what the Japanese are doing so much research on, because <laughs> yeah. they, 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 they take monkey whales, and the monkey whales are all over the world, and they went off the coast of Japan, they'd find them. Why they go to the Antarctic, I don't know. Yeah, so the Norwegians still still uh, hunt them, don't they? And I guess I was asking if, if it was just oil, but of course it's food for them as well, isn't it? The Norwegians it, eat... It them. is, yes. You can go to Norway and, and today and, and the whale meat is, is freely available. A lot of the markets and that, you can buy it in kilo packs. Mm -hmm. um, but the Norwegians, they, it's only monkey whales they take. There's no, there's no Norwegian expeditions going to the Antarctic now. No. It's just the small boats, about maybe 50, 60 feet long, who, who go out and they have a... I spoke with a Norwegian one day who was on them, and they had a quota for 13 whales, and they got seven, I think, for mm -hmm. that reason. But that was as many as they could take. So, um, so I that... don't think that's doing just a, a great deal of damage, and no. it's, um, people must eat. So was that your last trip then, that disastrous trip, or was there another one after that? No, no, uh, we went back again. Uh, they, they repaired the engine, and they, they actually put a new bow on the catcher, he made it a lot higher, mm -hmm. and um, so I was down for the third season on that. And then you, you didn't yeah, get another season? Yeah, from Middlesbrough, pardon? Sorry, I was, saying, and I was saying, so that was the last season, there was three seasons you did, and then, then you had your motorbike accident and couldn't go That's again, right. is that right? Yeah. And then I was, um, yeah, this, this, uh, that season I didn't get down because I was still... <laughs> wearing a plaster yeah, yeah. and then um, so the next season I asked about going back again and there was a lot of people wanting to go then I didn't know if I'd get or not but um, I did salvage and sent uh, word to me one day could I arrive at the office in a week's time and I did so that time we went we flew across to Norway all the catchers had come back to Norway mm -hmm. and had been repaired and and service there so we took the catcher from Norway right down to South Georgia and then to the ice and then back to South Georgia at the end of the season and then home to Norway um, <clears throat> that was the that trip home the, the roaring 40s really gave us the daddy of all bad weather <laughs> um, one of the other catchers one of the big ones the ex-corvettes had broken down with a similar problem to what we'd had mm -hmm. And she was towed back to Beef Harbour during the season and then they picked up and they established a tow behind the factory ship for her. And the weather came up behind us, I remember, us running down these big seas. And then we had to turn the ship during the night and face it. Yeah. But the factory ship tried to turn because the catcher was overtaking us, mm -hmm. running up first one side and then the other. So they were, they were anxious about the propellers. Yeah. So they turned her around, but she, with the weather that came on, she never got her head right up, and it was very, very difficult. And the catcher, there was, they, um, they thought that she was going to capsize at times. So um, they had two crews of men standing by. There was two two tow ropes on her, one over each bow and then over each side of the stern of the factory ship. They had men standing by with axes to to cut her away if if she went over. Yeah. But she survived, and they got her to Norway. Most of them were broken up. Um, some went to be fishing boats. The one I was on that year was actually back in Lerwick a few years later as a purse netter. Mm -hmm. And um, some were made into little... Uh, in the boats, like, you remember the Space Clara coming yeah, into yeah. the 
Yeah. Yeah, they were made like that. Just little boats that went around the islands and serviced the islands, you know, took in cargo and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So, um... So then you came back to Shetland and had a, a slightly less crazy, adventurous life with with the Enterprise? Is that what happened? Or was that the next step? <laughs> That could be exciting too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I come back and that was. I worked with uh, the f- the firm that I was working with, and I, I got my job back for the last season with Taj, William Taj, here in Larwick. Mm-hmm. So I got work with them again. We were working at the power station in Larwick, breaking out an old engine bed and putting in a new one. Mm-hmm. And then um, this man started uh, buying crabs in Larwick, that Jock Lorry. And of course, you had uh, Peter McGriff from here, from Weasel working over here, and Lori Garrick from Westerwick working here. And they got in on those crabs, and of course, they had bigger boats and, and uh, were doing okay. It set me going. I had this little boat, it was just an open boat, like just an open ship and model with a mm-hmm. little Stuart Turner in it. So I, I spoke with a guy one day, he said, Why don't you go to the Whitefish Authority? They're, they give you. They have a scheme where you can apply to them to have a fishing boat built, mm-hmm. and um, you get the, you lay down so much, and they give you a third of the boat as a grant, and you only pay back a third and as a as a loan. But uh, I can't remember now what their interest rate was. It was well, well, but but it seemed attractive. So I went in for that, and that was when I got the enterprise. So that was 1966. Wow. She was launched. And you've still got her? She's still here, yes. She's being converted into a motor sailor. Fantastic. To go? <laughs> to go where? <laughs> Are you, have you got touring plans? Oh, yes. Yeah, we'll go somewhere where. South Georgia? Yeah, it's just, I've had it too long. That's 51 years I've had it. Wow. Superb. Would you head back down to South Georgia for a tour, or you maybe miss that off the itinerary? Mm, maybe just not as far as that, no. <laughs> I'd love to go back. I'd love to go back and see it, and I'd love to go down to the Antarctic again and see the, all the wildlife that was down there. If you ever get a chance to, to go there, it's, it's fantastic. It was a, it was a great, great adventure to go on. You went away, and within a few days, you'd see more people than you'd ever seen in your total life up till then. Yeah, yeah. And your first time on a train, your first time on a double-decker bus, and... You'd never seen streets that wide before, and <laughs> it was an adventure. And you met people from all over the country, and uh, a lot of them to this day remain friends. And the Norwegians are the same. We've quite a few friends over in Norway. We we're g- all getting on a bit now, so aren't we all? Do you ever get a chance to meet up with any of your old whaling buddies? We have been across in Norway a few times. And there's, uh, there is still an active club down in Edinburgh. A right? few years since I went down there to meet up with them, but the last time I met up with them, we, we went across to Norway. Where uh, our son Ian lives in Norway. Him and uh, Lorena and I and another whaling friend of mine and his wife went over and spent a few days with them, and then we took the train across from Bergen to, the Bergen to Oslo train. We got off at Tonsberg and had a few days with the ex-whalers there. We went around. There's still one catcher left, one whale catcher, belonging, or used to belong to the Salvisons, the Southern Actor. Mm-hmm. She's based in Sandyfjord. And if you're ever over there, it's well worth a look. Superb. Well, thanks for speaking to me, Gibby. I really appreciated your time and your story there. Yeah, it's no problem. Great stuff. If we don't pass it down, it's going to be, going to be gone. Did you... St- were you aware of the book we took out the other year? Uh, I have heard something about it. I think that's why the guys at the Shetland Times, Adam and Colin, uh, suggested oh, yes, yes, I speak to you guys. They, they made it. They put it yeah. together for us. And then, I, of course, I realised it was you, and that I obviously knew who you were, but it, it, it had come about independently of that. Yeah, it was those guys because of the book. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's probably what. Eighty or so ex whalers are on Shetland yet, but some of them are very, very old men. Yeah. The the youngest one will be in his seventies, first of his seventies. Is there any is there any equivalent do you think these days that young Shetlanders would go away and do? I mean, it's quite extreme to be away from seven to eighteen months. Even if you were in the military, you wouldn't tend to have a tour that long. I don't think so. 
um, when you think about it, if that was going on today, I mean, you could be in constant touch via a, a laptop yeah. with home. There you had, uh, when you went away, the first mail you got was when you got to Carapito. Mm -hmm. Mail would be waiting for you. And then some, occasionally some was waiting in Leith Harbour. And you might, you certainly had once during the season that you'd get mail, maybe twice. Occasionally a little was left in Leith Harbour for you, or was available there when you came back on the way home. But that was it. Anything could have happened. Folk have oh, yeah. passed yeah. away. People have had children. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and the, the, it was uh, the last year we went down was sixty two, sixty three, and this was just at the time of the Cuban crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all wondered if we'd have a home to come back to. Yeah. Who was going to blink first? Yeah. And uh, it really was pretty tense. Uh, it was good days. I look back on it as a, as a great adventure, and along with very, very fine men. It's funny, I've worked quite a few places besides that, but um, you never made friends anywhere else like you did at the Whaley, mm -hmm. for some reason or other. I don't know what it was. It probably was the remoteness of it. It, uh, it wasn't, there was always people who had accidents and died and... There was one very sad accident, uh, incident. The, the second year I was down, that was another thing that happened that year, but not on my ship. When the factory came down, and we were down there in South Georgia before, uh, and when the factory came down, of course, I went aboard there. I knew some of the boys would be on it. And they said, come on over here to the Norwegian mess room and look at this. So there was a young boy there. He'd been, oh, he probably... A head taller than me and big and broad and just a hefty guy, pure Norwegian, blonde and very, very nice fellow. And uh, he was just massive among the rest of them. And a uh, very nice guy I spoke to him. Of course, we, being on the catcher, you learn quite a bit of Norwegian, so I mm -hmm. could converse with him. And, and uh, later on during the season, we heard that he was in the hospital. Um, we thought it was polio. The word went around that it was polio that he had, but it turned out it wasn't. It was some sort of a creeping paralysis. Okay. And it affected his legs and his balance first. And he ended up in the hospital, and then as this progressed, he began having difficulty breathing. And if he had been uh, in a hospital, he would have been in an iron lung. Mm -hmm. But uh, nobody knew anything about this, so the doctor or the captain contacted a hospital somewhere and found out about this. And they kept in touch with this hospital. And the engineers and carpenters and what have you, electricians, turned to in the free time, and they made an iron lung. And they put him in that. It kept him alive for a few weeks, because the hope was that he could get home, mm -hmm. you know, to see his parents and that. But... Uh, he didn't. He died uh, about the day that we went into Cape Town. Yeah. So he was buried at sea down there. He was only 16. That was a sad kind of a day. Yeah, it's pretty rough. I guess, yeah, medical, you're a long way from proper medical uh, attention in that kind of place, aren't you? And with a yeah, lot, a lot of risk. Yeah, they the doctor, of course. And the doctor could do the best he could, but they, um, there was one guy, the first reason I was down, he, he was coming down out of the barrel of the catcher when the, the rigging goes up from the gunnel to the boat up to the mast and then the barrel's above that so there's mm -hmm. a vertical ladder that takes you up and he came down this day and he lost his footing and fell and he fell right down on the, on the gunnel of the boat and oh, man. didn't do himself any good so they had to go to the factory with him and he was in urgent need of an of an operation, of course, and the mm -hmm. doctor had never been faced with anything like that before. So they got in touch with the hospital in Melbourne, in Australia, and uh, this operation was quite a delicate one. He, his spleen was bust, mm -hmm. and he had broken ribs, and he had a whole lot of things wrong with him, as you can imagine, yeah. falling 50, 60 feet. And he, uh, they, they, they stopped the ship, they stopped all production, because um, the, the hospital was aft on the ship, and that's where they took the whales on board. Mm -hmm. And there was a big whale claw, big heavy metal whale claw that 
they would lower down the, the chute on the wires and it would land with a clang and a bang every now and then. Mm -hmm. So um, rather than upset the doctor or startle him, then they, they, they stopped all production. I think it was four or five hours. Yeah. And um, he came through, he pulled through. In fact, he's still alive today. He lives in, in, in Malig, the west coast of Scotland. And um, a few years ago, there was a... Well, the last time we were over in Norway, then um, there was a BBC crew came across to do some filming and, and interviews of us whalers. And this was displayed on uh, BBC One one evening. And there's people staying in Sanas, in, in, in Busta, you know, mm -hmm. for Busta, right yeah, at the yeah. same day. Little of Busta, the, the North Muslims. And this guy, I know him very well, so he phoned up and he said, uh, there's people, they're not beside us at the moment, they're exploring Unst and Yell at the moment, but uh, the man was at the whaling mm -hmm. one year. So when he comes back here, come across and meet him. Yeah. So I went over and he was with the Southern Venturer Expedition, yes. I said, what was his job? Oh, he was the hospital mess boy. Mm -hmm. I said, remember the guy who fell from the barrel? He said, I'll never forget him, he says. He must be dead now. I says, no, he's alive. <laughs> Still alive in Malay. That's good heavens, he says. I didn't think that man was going to pull through. Yeah. Now, his job, he had to bring the food aft for the for the for anybody who was in the hospital and keep things clean, of course. And uh, one of his jobs was to count out the instruments the doctor laid out and count them after. Mm -hmm. And this man came in, he says, and everything stopped. And the the engineers or the, the radio operators rigged up a loudspeaker system or a radio system whereby the doctor in Melbourne could talk his way, talk to the doctor in the factory, talk him through the, the operation. You see this and you see yeah. that. And now this or that had to be touched or ha worked with. And he says, um, during the operation, the guy's heart stopped. Oh, my goodness. And he says, the doctor massaged him oh. and got him going again. Yeah. I says, well, this Peter Gillis, I says, he doesn't know that. He never said that to me. So um, I told him where Peter was staying. And and uh, when he went back down south, I think he stayed in Lancashire. Mm -hmm. so, so he says, that's not far out of the way. We'll snip across and meet him. And they did. <laughs> Brilliant. And Brilliant. Uh, so when we were putting this book together, there's a section of it that uh, talks about accidents. And, of course, this was one of the... That's always mentioned. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, I, I contacted him and I said, would you give us a story? We'll give you a book if you give us a story. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave us the, the story of being the mess boy at that operation. So that's all in there. Nice one. Give us the name of the book before you go, Gibby. Give us the name check on the book again in case anybody wants to pick it up. It's Shetland's Whaling Tradition. Shetland's Whaling Tradition. Nice From one. Wallafjord to Enderby Land. And what's the... Are, are you, is it you that's the author? No, no, it's no. Laureen Johnson. Okay. Well, we got Laureen to come in, and and uh, she's done quite a few books, and I know her personally, and she's a very sound person, so we got her, and she she come in, not sure. All she knew about Quelling was she lived in the sea. <laughs> but by the time that we finished the book, she knew the difference in lots of things. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> But it's, um, yeah, Wallafjord is a place in, in, um, in Greenland. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know that at the time. But all we knew about Wallafjord was it's the name of a tune that came back from the Greenland quailing days. You see, the book starts off with uh, quailing before Greenland and then going to Greenland. And then the whaling industry was here in Shetland. There was four or five whaling stations here at one time. Mm -hmm. One of them was Salvison's, and that was where Salvison met the Shetland men, and found out about Shetland men, and, and liked what he saw, and, and stayed with them. Yeah. Invited them down to the south, southern hemisphere. And um, and uh, we we thought that this Wallafjord, we didn't know if it, was a, if it still existed, or was it just a, a name that the whalers had given to the place. But mm -hmm. as a guy, Morris Henderson, guy who plays fiddle a lot he uh, he's actually been there and it's a it's a little 
it's a village with what, a little community with 5,000 people in it, and fishing and hunting and that sort of thing. It does exist after all, and of course, uh, Enderby Land was one of the places down around the, the Antarctic continent. It's notorious for its bad weather. And so that's the, so that's the, the sort reason of for the title. Yeah, superb. I will, I'm going to pick it up. I am genuinely inspired to pick it up after hearing your stories, Gibby. So thank you. Huh? And, no uh, problem at all. Good luck with the uh, rest of the conversion of the Enterprise. When When is it going to be ready to sail? I would think maybe next month sometime. Yeah, she's coming pretty ready today and up to now. If, uh, I put two bunks in her and a little sort of a low cabin for it and then a higher one that you can stand up in and a cooker and toilet in the after end. And, oh, all mud guns. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. It's been a, it's been a very interesting job. It's been certainly more expensive than I thought it would be, but uh, I'm not worrying about that. Spend some of your old uh, tax-free whale money that you put away back in 1961. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll have to read some of that. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gibby Fraser there. And if you've got any feedback for us with the podcast, please do get in touch via shetlandtimes.co.uk or through the Facebook page or you can catch up with myself at Thor Holt on Twitter or through my website, thorholt.com. And as Gibby kindly mentioned, the Shetland Times can help you publish your book. So if you've got a book idea, get in touch with them. Thanks. Speak to you next time.